This morning's host, Lonnie Poindexter, and today's program is titled Ministry Monday. Co-hosting with, with me this morning is Dean Nelson. Dean is Vice President of Urban Outreach for CareNet, a wonderful ministry and, and program taking place here in D.C. that addresses alternative resources for pregnancy. Dean, you want to chime in a little bit about CareNet's value proposition? Well, thanks, Lonnie. It's great to be here with you, and uh, thank you to uh, Kira for uh, hosting this wonderful program. Yeah, as uh, we talked a little bit last week, uh, I've actually been serving at CareNet for uh, about two and a half years. Uh, our mission is to uh, really um, provide uh, services and to share the gospel with men and women who are facing unplanned pregnancies. Uh, with all of the talk you know, about abortion in our nation, oftentimes people uh, don't realize that there are thousands of pregnancy centers all across America that are there willing to provide counsel, uh, material assistance, as well as uh, free uh, pregnancy tests and free ultrasounds for women who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy. And so we're really excited about uh, some of the uh, gains that we've made over the last few years, uh, some of the new partnerships that have been developed, and how people are rethinking this issue and wanting to be uh, more committed to serving in their community uh, by planting more pregnancy centers, particularly in urban America. So uh, we're really excited about that, and we're also excited about our partnership with, uh, with CURE uh, as we go into these urban areas. Yes, and CURE as well is very excited about the uh, partnership and um, our CARE Net, uh, excuse me, CURE Net um, Pastor Network, which takes place across the nation, and our goal is to find like-minded um, ministries and pastors um, will walk with us and mobilize with us with a, uh, a message of freedom and personal responsibility. And we believe that uh, um, alternative pregnancy centers are, are part and partial to that and, and a very important, um, we think, uh, uh, ministry or sub-ministry within the church community. So the uh, CureNet pastors across the country, um, our goal is to have each one of them um, function with a um, with a pregnancy resource center there, uh, partnered with CareNet. So very excited about that relationship. Uh, many things going on to, uh, in, in the Beltway this morning. I wanted to talk about something that took place last night, and that was the uh, D.C. Emancipation Day and the great debate in which our, our very own Star Parker um, are participating in a panel discussion along with um, other um, noted uh, people within the, uh, within uh, the political realm and also within the, uh, the church community. Um, speakers for the event were uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton, um, who uh, we're all very familiar with, also as Niger Ennis, who is the national spokesperson for the Congress on Racial Equality, otherwise known, e equality, known as uh, CORE, and an MSNBC contributor, and um, Dr. Julian Malvo, who is an author and political a commentator based here in Washington, D.C. It was a spirited discussion. They covered a variety of topics uh, from same-sex marriage to the economy um, to the uh, Second Amendment. And um, let's just say it was very spirited and, um, and very interesting from my vantage point because I actually sat in the gallery and had a chance to watch and engage the uh, audience as um, they listened to the different speakers um, uh, position of their value proposition of what needs to take place in our nation. Um, Starr was very keen on illustrating that over the last 40, 50 years um, in this nation, in communities traditionally run by, uh, that were run by those in the, um, uh, the DNC or the Democratic Party, those elected officials, that not much had changed in the way of uh, improving the condition of uh, of African Americans in the uh, larger communities, urban communities um, like Chicago, Detroit, and so forth. So they all had varying uh, opinions about uh, what uh, what the solution was. And our solution, or Star's solution, was for a limited government and personal responsibility, and for the church to take its rightful place in those communities with disseminating social programs, um, because they're the best suited to do that. In addition, can do it most cost effectively. So it was a uh, great event. It had uh, it was at the take, took place at the the Lincoln Theater, which is a historic theater within Washington D.C. Street on, on on U Street, and they had, had a pretty good turnout. Uh, it wasn't full, but um, there was a good representation. Um, uh, D.C. Emancipation had had to do also with uh, uh, Washington D.C. being the first locale that uh, 
uh, was freed after Lincoln's uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Um, they also dovetailed that into uh, the very real concern that Washington, D.C. residents have that um, they are uh, under taxation without representation. So that was a hot topic as well. Also wanted to delve into um, something that Dean had brought up, and I'll let him chime in here. Um, another hot topic is uh, Kermit Gosnell, the, uh, uh, the proprietor of the abortion mill in Philadelphia. That's, uh, he's under fire and under arrest and currently in trial. And the, um, the fact that um, there wasn't much media coverage on it. And Dean, what did you note from something you saw? Well, one of the things that was really exciting to note, uh, Lonnie, was last week, uh, largely within the pro-life movement, there was a, a Twitter bomb <laughs> that began to, uh, to erupt, basically calling for the mainstream media to give more attention to this trial. One of the reporters actually stated that this could be one of the biggest trials of the century, and yet no one is actually covering it. And so when pro-lifers uh, actually went to uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, to create a stir, it was exciting to see that there was a little bit of response. Uh, number one, I believe it was on last uh, Thursday, I believe, where actually uh, Kirsten Powers wrote an op-ed that was actually in the USA Today that really, and, and she's a Democratic strategist, and she said no matter where you fall on this issue, this issue in Philadelphia, this situation with Gosnell has to be covered. And so she began to call out uh, mainstream media. And then lo and behold, on Friday evening, the lead story for Anderson Cooper, 15 minutes dedicated very specifically to the details of this gruesome uh, you know, uh, trial that, that highlights, I mean, just the very gruesome details of what Gosnell had done. Uh, you had, you know, multiple uh, babies that were born alive that he uh, snipped uh, the back, you know, of their neck, their spine severed. I mean, you had workers that talked about seeing and, and, and grieving of, of seeing shaking babies that actually were dying before their very eyes, blood-stained carpets. They talked about fetal remains that were in jars throughout the place. And most shockingly, and I was really surprised that Anderson Cooper actually covered this in great detail, but spoke specifically about although Gosnell, who is an African-American doctor within the community, literally had sections, two sections in his facility where white women would go and where minority women would go. The one where the minority women would go, according to the DA, actually was much more squalid, as he stated, than the other conditions. And it was just incredible to see 15 minutes as a lead story given by Anderson Cooper on, uh, on AC360 uh, on Friday evening. Uh, it's our hope that more of the mainstream media will pick up on this uh, by any estimation. Uh, this should be a huge national news story. I agree with you, Dean, and I, th I think this speaks to the power of social media and the ability of the Christian community um, to compel um, traditional media to um, get engaged with the story because they, by and large, had, had ignored this. And according to uh, Dave Gardner, who participated last week and uh, sitting in the gallery at the trial, uh, there was very, very low turnout in terms of just um, people sitting in the gallery, but there was literally no media at the event, and she was appalled to see that. And so what we're looking to do is mobilize the Christian community to, um, to stand up and speak out. She's actually attending the trials this week. Uh, Day is the uh, president of the uh, National Black Pro-Life Union based here in Washington, D.C., which is a group of, of, of activist pastors and Christian, Christian activists across the nation that, um, that are uh, standing for life. Um, they actually work very closely with CureNet and also with Cure here in Washington, D.C. And so uh, social media is, is a tool that can be used. And as you go out and send those tweets and, um, and you engage within Facebook and other mediums out there relative to social media, you can drive this debate and you can, we can get the media to uh, do what we would think that they would do just, a, just as a, con a consequence of what they're chartered to do, which is report the news. This is very important news. I also wanted to point out that uh, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Michael Johnson, who was a part of Greater Exodus um, Baptist Church based in Philadelphia and has a, a crisis pregnancy center located there, um, is looking to mobilize the congregants from 
this particular church. The senior pastor there is Pastor Herb Lusk, and um, they're going to be turning out in mass uh, to that um, to that trial to make sure that, if nothing else, that the, um, the the powers that be understand that it's an important issue and it needs to be dealt with. And and you know this is pretty ghastly the the, the things that this um, this individual was doing. But um, those of us that are very familiar with pro life and the pro life movement and also very familiar with the abortion and the abortion industry, know that this is not necessarily the exception. There are things taking place across this nation on a regular basis. This is just the one that got the news and the one that is finally um, um, coming to uh, the forefront. And I personally think it's uh, um, the Lord is making uh, what was done in the dark um, come to the light. So thank you very much, Dean. That was um, actually very, very important, near and dear to all of our hearts here um, at Cure. Well, I think uh, what you stated, Lonnie, is extremely uh, accurate, and we know firsthand because of members uh, that are a part of our Life Ambassadors Initiative in different states around the country, Mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, in Chicago, Illinois. I mean, even right here just outside of the Beltway in Maryland, we know just several months ago a young woman died at the hands of a late-term abortionist. And so Mm -hmm. we know that these things are, as you stated, not the exception, but rather they are the rule. It's just this is what happens when you have 40 years of an industry that has grown to be a multi-billion dollar industry Mm -hmm. that is largely unregulated. I mean, right now in the Commonwealth of Virginia, there are actually... um, Uh, hearings that have been scheduled where they are evaluating how they can place more restrictions on many of these abortion clinics because most realize, at least within our circles, we realize when you have uh, abortion numbers uh, over 50 percent, like in the in the in the city of Richmond or uh, up, you know, in in New York City, where there's a high abortion rate, almost 60 percent in the African-American community. When you have that type of industry that has built itself up there's bound to be so much levels of corruption and uh, obviously greed that's going on. I mean, the Bible says, you know, that it's the the love of money that's the root of all sorts of evil. And I feel like that in many of these cases you've had, uh, like in Philadelphia, the government, uh, state government, as well as the local government has turned a blind eye. Nobody really has reported very much that Gosnell had over $100,000 of cash <clears throat> in his facility. Um, why do you have to have that much cash? I, I believe that there is a level of corruption that city government, state government has been involved in. Yes. And I believe that we're going to see more and more of these type of examples of Gosnell coming to light in many of these urban areas. Yes, and when you think of the, the poor women that are coming into the um, chamber of horrors, as I like to call it, um, and being... Uh, um, exposed to um, the conditions and so forth there, and they're feeling that they have no alternative and they have no way out. Uh, you pastors that are out there with your, your churches and your communities, many times you are the community organizers. You are the ones that are sitting on the wall as watchmen to, 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 to call out, uh, um, just to call out evil and, and to speak truth to power. Um, if, if you're interested in starting a pregnancy center as a part of your ministry, uh, Dean, tell them what they can do to be a part of CareNet. Thank you so much, Lana. Yeah, one of the things that they can do uh, immediately is they can go to our website, which is uh, carenetburban.org. That's carenetburban.org. A number of ways that uh, pastors or community leaders can be involved. They can join our Life Ambassadors program where we empower leaders to be effective within their communities. They can even um, join uh, our program to learn how to start a pregnancy center within that community. And so that's something that we emphasize uh, strongly. We're training up hundreds of leaders in urban communities around the country to be more effective in the fight for life. Well, thank you, Dean. We're going to head to a station break, and we'll be right back with you shortly. Welcome back, everyone, to Star Parker's Inside the Beltway radio program, hosted today by Lonnie Poindexter and Dean Nelson, coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Before the station break, we were speaking on the um, the trial that's taking place in Philadelphia with um, with Kermit um, Gosnell, who is uh, on trial for murder, for murdering the innocent. And... Um, 
Dean, could you speak to us uh, about what women can do who are facing an unplanned pregnancy in terms of how um, they can reach out and have someone um, work with them and, and walk with them through that, that difficult time? Yes, Lonnie. One of the things that we've tried to highlight, particularly there in Philadelphia, uh, not far from uh, Gosnell's abortion clinic, is, uh, as you've mentioned, a, a good friend of ours, uh, Herb Lusk, who started the Hope Pregnancy Center, which is uh, a center that provides free services to women facing unplanned pregnancies uh, right there in Philadelphia. But even uh, broader than that, because they are part of uh, CareNet's organization, uh, broader than just that, CareNet has launched something that's been really important. It's called our Pregnancy Decision Line. Pregnancy Decision Line is essentially a toll-free number uh, and, and a website where women can call, text, chat, email to find a loving, kind, non-judgmental voice on the other line that can help give them some counsel and lead them into a healthy decision regarding their pregnancy. And so I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to mention uh, PregnancyDecisionLine.org. That's PregnancyDecisionLine.org, where people can direct women who are struggling with this decision once they find out that they're pregnant. And if they don't go online, they can also call that toll-free number, which is 877-791-5475. Again, that number for Pregnancy Decision Line is 877-791-5475, where they can call toll-free, get a non-judgmental, kind, loving coach on the other line that's going to help uh, them to make a healthy decision tell them about a whole host of resources that are available to them uh, so that they don't have to have the thought that there's no other option except abortion. Well, thank you very much, Dean. That is um, great information, and uh, it's a, a wonderful ministry doing amazing work here in our nation's capital and across this great nation, and please um, uh, um, exercise the opportunity to call them if you are in need. Uh, great, great, great ministry. Okay, now we wanted to um, maybe touch base on some things happening here inside the Beltway as it relates to uh, um, things taking place rel- relative to um, our, um, on the political scene. And um, here in D.C., um, as we speak, there are meetings taking place um, just across the way a little bit from us of uh, some of the, I don't know what to say other than say some of the heavyweights within the, uh, the uh, black conservative movement um, um, in, in black conservative Christian movement um, as a strategy set strategy sessions um, as it relates to uh, next steps moving forward with the uh, conservative movement. Um, Herman Cain, who I'm sure you all are familiar with, who um, was one of the front runners in the uh, election uh, last year, um, has assembled um, a, a panel of um, of who's who within the black conservative Christendom to come together and talk about some of the issues and develop a strategy going forward. Um, um, that um, you'll see in the coming months uh, uh, throughout the rest of the year and uh, coming up to our next election. Some of the attendees that he had at this particular event uh, were um, Harry Alford, uh, who is the president of the uh, National Black Chamber of Commerce based here in D.C., who is, I believe it's something in the neighborhood of 2 million black businesses across the country um, that are members of that organization, Uh, Reverend A.R. Bernard, Ken Blackwell, who actually sits on the board of directors and is the uh, uh, head of the board of directors for, for Cure, was actually one of the attendees. And Dr. Ben Carson, as I mentioned uh, earlier, Niger Ennis, who is the, um, the director of CORE, Congress on Racial Equality, um, based out of uh, New York City. And um, Dr. Alveda King, our, yours truly, Star Parker, was there, our very own Star Parker, um, Colonel Allen West, um, Walter Williams and um, and Armstrong Williams. So that is taking place as we sit here in our program uh, with those individuals. So I'll be excited to report on that next week as to what took place. If Star doesn't preempt me in her program uh, programming because she's got more days than I have here on the station, she'll probably mention that before I get back to you next Monday. But um, a great event that's taking place across town. I wanted to uh, touch base on something that. Uh, uh, we're going to be doing going forward uh, with the radio program on Monday, and um, and um, it's something to feature. I something that I think is very important within uh, within the community that just doesn't get the uh, the notoriety. 
And that is to speak to uh, what I call the overcomers. Uh, we hear all the time in media about uh, what can't be done because of uh, obstacles and circumstances, be they racial, economic, uh, socioeconomic, um, across this nation. But uh, um, our nation was built upon individuals that overcame. And these are people that, in spite of the obstacles, were able to find a way. And um, so in the coming weeks, I'm, we're going to feature uh, one individual um, or one ministry that has done that. In spite of the odds, they have found a way. And, um, and, and, and what I like to speak to is something that uh, my dear old dad taught me is that uh, the way that you overcome is to stay focused, have faith in your creator, and to ignore the peripheral things that, uh, uh, that may come your way, and God will open doors that no man can close. And uh, his own life spoke to that. I might even feature him in one of those Mondays. But I want to um, just uh, bring to the audience that um, if you, you have people that you know that are overcomers, that in spite of the obstacles were able to succeed um, in this great land of ours, um, that we bring them to the forefront and we make sure that we feature them in a way that uh, uh, would get the message out so that our young people coming up would know that um, there are some really great individuals out there in this great land of ours, and they don't necessarily get the uh, notoriety or the press, certainly not maybe our entertainers or actors or things of that nature that we tend to think of as stars, but certainly uh, they make up the very fabric of this nation. So I wanted to point that out. So the next topic, so I want to throw this over to Dean. Did you have anything that you wanted to speak on, Dean, that uh, you think is at the forefront that we need to hear about? Sure. There's uh, actually one thing, Lonnie, that we've discussed a little bit that's kind of been bubbling under the surface and is soon to uh, to be a, a huge issue, and that is uh, the NAACP's most recent uh, attack on one of our organi- member organizations within the Black Pro-Life Coalition, a ministry that some people are familiar with called the Radiance Foundation. Yes. Um, not long ago, uh, the Radiance Foundation, among other uh, black pro-life organizations did actually host a protest of sorts against the NAACP for its strong abortion ties. Since that time, the NAACP has now come out against the Radiance Foundation for what they're saying is uh, copyright uh, or trademark infringement. Uh, all that was done within this campaign was that the Radiance Foundation, and this wasn't particular really to Ryan Bomberger and his organization because others have said this, but he put actually in writing a part of his campaign, quote, civil wrong, and then under it it said the National Association for the Abortion of Colored People. Well, that ticked off the NAACP, uh, and I think, you know, someone used to say, you know, if you, if you throw – throw a rock to a pack of dogs and you hear them scream, you know it hit, right? <laughs> so in this case, it's clear that, uh, that it is hit, and the NAACP has now hired one of the most high-powered uh, law firms in the country to actually come against the Radiance Foundation because, of again, what they're stating is um, trademark infringement. Now, there was no alteration at all to the NAACP's logo. There was nothing done. This is a simple free exercise uh, of free speech that Ryan Bomberger and the Radiance Foundation has participated in. But what we do know is since this has occurred, the NAACP, in their written statement to uh, the Radiance Foundation, and this case is actually going to be probably coming up fairly quickly actually in, uh, in Virginia. I'm not sure which circuit court but it's going to be coming up in Virginia. But they are simply saying uh, that the Radiance Foundation did not have the right to call them out, essentially, on their position. Since that time, of course, on their website, they have taken down any links Mm -hmm. to Planned Parenthood, who has been a sponsor for the NAACPs for several of their events over the last several years. They they also took out uh, links that they had on their website, I believe, that – connected them to uh, the abortion industry. And they've stated that they have no uh, position, no official position on the issue of abortion. Well, if you don't have an official position, then why are you taking money from Planned Parenthood? If you don't have an official position, why did you take that off of your website if, in fact, you have no, quote-unquote, 
position. The reality is is that they have been in bed with the abortion lobby for some time, and I believe that this trial is going to come up and is going to actually uh, bring to light, again, an, a multi-million dollar organization that was once started to serve black people, but now really has little interest in the grassroots of what's going on in black America and has actually become uh, an, an industry power broker, and that's kind of how they see themselves today. And I believe that it's high time for other organizations um, like ours, uh, the Radiance Foundation, to call them to task. And I believe that that's what Ryan Baumberger and the, the team of lawyers that are supporting him are going to do. So we are going to actually host uh, on April 30th uh, a conference call for strategic leaders. It's our goal to have about 200 uh, leaders to be on this conference call um, where Ryan will be able to go into greater detail about what they want to do. And so uh, I want to uh, invite your listeners, if they are a member of CureNet or a member of our Life Ambassadors program, if they go, they sign up, become a part of that, they can have access to be a part of this strategic roundtable as we begin to move forward with launching this, uh, this strategy regarding the NAACP and their, their ties to the abortion industry. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, the NAACP, um, I'll just speak uh, candidly, uh, uh, I am saddened by um, what the organization has become based upon their legacy and um, being at the very forefront of the civil rights movement that took place in this nation and uh, literally um, stemming the tide and turning back uh, uh, systemic racism within our, within our nation. Um, today, um, their stand is very much different, and they've moved completely away, in my opinion, of their original charter so that they're now aligned with organizations that are really detrimental to the very community that they say that they serve. Uh, when you look at the uh, appalling uh, statistics with abortion and just what it's doing to our nation, uh, the very fact that 70-plus uh, percent of abortion clinics are located in and around um, urban communities, and you see this the sheer numbers in terms of uh, how many um, uh, uh, babies are aborted year in and year out. Um, our nation, um, uh, the black community has literally been cut in half in 40 years since Roe v. Wade, just to cut to the chase. Um, and um, something needs to be done, and, and we need to stand up, and we need to hold them accountable to their original charter. They either need to move back to their original charter, what they, um, the commitments that were made uh, many, many, many years ago with the, uh, those that, 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 that are icons today, um, um, or they need to move into, uh, well, there needs to be another organization that would rise up and take their place, quite frankly. Well, one of the things, Lonnie, I think that is important to highlight is, one, we're speaking specifically about the NAACP at the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have noticed actually through our grassroots work is, is that there are local and even state chapters that are very much different mm -hmm. than what they're doing at the national level. Uh, I think two years ago I had the opportunity to speak in Cincinnati at an event that was hosted by the NAACP where they were able to give us an opportunity to speak about the, 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 the drastic numbers of abortion within the African-American community. And as I took to that podium and spoke with a couple of other pro-life leaders, we were able to actually contrast our position, the numbers within the African-American community, to Planned Parenthood. And, I'm, and I, I need to report that the re person representing Planned Parenthood at that event uh, two weeks later was fired and was dismissed. I think, one, because we are beginning to make an impact at the local and the grassroots level because the African-American community, they this is not something, even when they're polled, they tend to, they are polled more supporting a pro-life position. And so I think that it's important for us to note that there are state and local chapters, even in the state of Georgia, for example. Mm -hmm. um, three or four years ago, uh, Catherine Davis, who was uh, working with Georgia Right to Life and the Radiance Foundation, had a particular bill that came up where they had the full support of the SCLC as well as the NAACP. Once the, 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 the national found out about the, the state chapter supporting it, they put pressure on that statement to withdraw their support. So we understand what their game is, and the reality is, is that at the state and at the local level, we have many, many people who are with us on this issue, but at the national level, the NAACP has sold itself. Great point. So there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. So 
change needs to be driven from the local level, which when you think about it from a grassroots level, that's how uh, things typically are changed. And so there's a disconnect between the leadership at the uh, national level and what the, the people out there every day dealing with the issues, what they see. And I agree with you, Dean, there's many, many people within the NAACP that are walking in lockstep with uh, what our core beliefs are, which are tied to the tenets of the faith.